the work that we do at Ferris, yes, we're a technology company, but we really believe in the way that we change family trees when a student earns their degree and how for all of the people around them, their cousins, their siblings, whoever it is, it changes what they think is possible. It changes the trajectory of their path. have joined us for another episode of Cap and Gown. I'm Rachel phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources. Super excited about our episode today. Um, we have a really fantastic guest. I can't wait to introduce you to him. Um, this is our sixth episode of this season. And for those of you who are counting, you are about two thirds the way done with your fall semester. Congratulations. Good work. I know so many of you are working on your advising and registration right now. So Godspeed <laughs> for you in that process. Um, there's, I know a lot that goes into that. And if you do advising really well, it's time consuming and um, you really make a huge difference to your students. So thank you for that. Um, if you are joining us uh, and LinkedIn, make sure that you follow us on LinkedIn so you'll get notifications whenever we get new episodes that come out. If you're listening to us on YouTube, you can subscribe so that you will get the same. If you are listening to us wherever you get your podcast, awesome. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be able to talk to you while, ever you, while you're doing whatever else you're doing. So thank you for that opportunity. Also, happy Halloween. Um, it's not as exciting when Halloween happens on a Tuesday. That's not the best, but um, my daughter who just started middle school had the opportunity to dress up today. She did not take it because she was not sure whether or not it was going to be cool to do that. So she's got to like get the lay of the land and then she'll decide uh, what she's going to do. We did not have an episode last week because I was traveling. I was in New Orleans, which was a great experience. We we're at the CSRDE, which is a conference that's really about retention and student success. And it was a great experience. Matt um, presented with one of our partners um, about retention and student success. And so that was a joy. However, they lost my bags both on the way there and the way home. So that was not awesome. I'm not going to tell you what airline it is, but I'm very unhappy with them. All right. Which brings us to the State of the Union. All right, the first article that I have for you is out of Inside Higher Ed. This is another student voice flash survey um, talking specifically around uh, orientation and what kinds of things students want to see in orientation. I am just going to be really honest with you. I find these articles incredibly hard to read. Usually I have to try to decipher them. I show them to Matt and then he's like, this is what they're trying to say. I'm going to read you. Don't, you're not going to understand this. I just want to tell you the kinds of things that I'm having to wade through um, as I'm bringing you articles. Here's a paragraph in this article. Overall, about three in 10 students each say that the ideal length for a new student orientation is a half day, a full day, and two to three days. Very few students say it should be longer. Does anybody know what that means? I don't know what that means. Let me tell you what I do know about what this article says. So first of all, they say students really want a choice when it comes to orientation. About 95% of the students that they polled said it's super important for them to be able to either attend online or in person to have some kind of choice in the matter. So I think that's really helpful. Many schools, especially over COVID, kind of adapted to that. Um, but it's important to students to be able to choose. The other thing is when you ask students about what topics they want um, to for you to cover in orientation, Things like mental health, time management, physical health and wellness, diversity, equity, inclusion, elective study skills, all of those things come out. I do think it's an interesting thing to ask um, students who maybe haven't been to orientation or have only been to orientation once, what kinds of things they think a school should cover, because maybe they don't have any idea about all of the things that would be most helpful um, for us to cover in those and then the paragraph I read to you before, basically what that means is your orientation should not be longer than three days. Almost all of the students said it should be between half a day and three days 
Um, but any longer than that is going to be too long for them. So they have some other suggestions in there. Um, In-person format is preferred from, by students. And of course, there's always the question in orientation about how you balance what the institution values and needs to tell students with what they want and, and how you kind of negotiate that. So there are some good things in that article, but I would really like for someone to just go through those student voice articles and like put, simplify them in a way that we can all kind of <laughs> dive into without using too many of our brain calories. <clears throat> All right, the next article that I have for you is a pretty interesting one. It's an opinion article coming out of Inside Higher Ed. It's specifically around FERPA, and it's um, the idea that maybe FERPA is not as high tech as it should be, which that should not be surprising for any of us, right? This is coming um, around an issue where some students got doxxed because of uh, their participation in, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, what do you call that when you're on campus in your protest, uh, on a, about a protest. What I think is interesting in this article though, is they talk about how FERPA got created. So 1974 is our first iteration of FERPA. And it really was like in 1974, hey, listen, you can release directory information, which we all know things like their full name, class year, home address, and participation in officially recognized um, activities. There was a slight change to FERPA in 1998, which says you can also release student photographs and email addresses. And that's really been the last functional change to FERPA. So it's really interesting when I work with schools, you just have like a very extreme oftentimes, like we can't tell anything anybody about or anyone anything about any student. And then on the other side, sometimes they're just sharing information really broadly. But this article talks about how FERPA was created in a time of phone books, where you actually did have directory information that existed. But now that we're thinking about an age of big data, online publication um, of directory student information actually makes students more vulnerable because you can kind of cross reference an email address with a social media account um, and find out a lot of information. And when we added in student photographs to directory information, now all of a sudden you're really opened up to biometric records, right? We can do facial recognition if we can get uh, pictures of our students. And so um, I think there's a really interesting conversation to have about how FERPA needs to change in this uh, environment of uh, more access to data and being able to cross-reference it. In 2008, FERPA did make an allowance that schools could pass on some of that identifiable information to vendors. So if you think about things like Canvas or SIS being able to pass that information on, they did make that change. But if you think about the loophole where now we can get all the directory information and cross-reference that to find social media pages, the anybody who is kind of an official of the school, including vendors, can get that information. And also remember that students actually cannot sue around FERPA uh, violations. So the only one who can sue is the U.S. Department of Education the way they would sue is they would actually threaten the federal funding of an institution, which is such a gigantic thing. It's actually never been done. And so if you think about like, we can't even really enforce it well, I think there's going to be some really rich conversations around what happens with FERPA, how do we need to change it and how do we need to think about it differently? So I think that's kind of on the horizon is something that uh, we're gonna be talking about in the semesters and years to come. All right, the next article that I have for you is six strategies to encourage college campus event attendance. I would encourage you to read this one. A couple of the things that they suggest that I really like are, first of all, interrupt the process. So specifically around disengaged students, if you are trying to get them to participate in some sort of campus event, you want to put it in a place where it disrupts what they normally do. So at the college I went to, we had chapel and then everybody left chapel and went over to lunch. So the idea would be that you would have a disruption to that normal flow. You would be standing kind of in the middle of that sea of students and be holding an event there so that it disrupts what they're used to doing and kind of puts them in a new place, which I think is a great idea. Um, make sure you create value for your, your events. I also really love this article suggests giving students responsibility for events and allowing ownership. And so if you think about some of your disconnected students who love something, 
saying to them, hey, why don't we have a, an event around that thing? Will you help me plan it? Will you invite your people? We'll give you some ownership over that is a great way to get some of those quiet students to be really connected. I will tell you, though, this article does my pet peeve, which is say, like, make sure you create belonging, but has absolutely no suggestions for how you do that, which why do we do that all the time? Like, we should create belonging. How do we do it? You guys know how we do it. Culture code gives us all of those uh, codes of belonging that we can send. So it's a good article if you're thinking about your events. All right. I have two more for you. One is, I don't know if you guys saw that the U.S., uh, the U.S. is now banning transcript holds, which is really, really interesting. Um, this is a really common practice for so many schools that if you haven't paid your balance, they're going to withhold your transcript so you can't go on to another school. This law is saying we actually you have to give a transcript for all of the classes that a student has taken and paid for. So if I've paid you for three years, and then I have one semester of outstanding balance, you still have to be able to give me my transcript for those three years. You can hold it for the, the classes that I haven't paid for, which I think is really interesting. So those rules are going to take effect July 1st, 2024. They're not finalized yet, but it looks like that's how they're moving. And this is gonna be retroactive as well. So that means that students who previously have had their transcripts held, that is not going to be legal anymore. You have to release those to them so that they can go on and do other things. So it's going to be interesting to see how our registrars deal with that and also to see how that affects um, students' participation in other things that they may need their um, transcript for. All right. The last one that I have for you <laughs> is called psychology professor uses zombies in neuroscience unit, which I love. So this uh, professor who's named Eugene de Rob Robertis um, is a professor at Brookdale Community College. He uh, decided a couple of years ago, he was teaching psychology students and he was really concerned because he noticed that they didn't have sort of a ground level understanding of how the brain works. So if you think about like just basic neuroscience concepts, they really were struggling. And so he decided that he was going to create a video game that's called Zombie Resurrection, where students have to apply their knowledge of the brain, of neurons and nervous system parts and processes and functions to reanimate the dead and save all of humanity. So um, he, this is an online game that he created with the Teaching and Learning Center um, on his campus. It's been in play for 10 years, so students really love it and they think it's really fun. And what I think is really admirable about this is that um, students who played the science-based game ended up scoring an average of 10 points higher on the corresponding unit assessments than those peers who didn't. So obviously it's really effective for helping students learn those kind of basic brain uh, understandings. Also, I tried to find it online. I would love to play that game. I think it would be really awesome. So we love to acknowledge when people are um, really innovative in the ways that they create pathways for students to be successful. So. That is the State of the Union for this week, our last day in October. And I am thrilled that that means I get to introduce to you our guest. So joining me is Matthew Little. He's the Student Success Coordinator at the University of Tennessee Southern. Hello, Matthew. Hi, Rachel. How are you? I am so good. I'm thrilled that you have joined us today. Um, I want to introduce you in the most appropriate way possible, given all of your experiences. So I want to tell you, first of all, that I went to your LinkedIn page and I was going to print all of the experiences that you had. And then my printer said that's going to be 20 pages long. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I was like, maybe I'll just refer <laughs> to, to, to some of those experiences. You have done so many amazing things. I, I've just, I've had a lot of opportunities and, and, and luckily I, I've, I, had the good fortune to work with a lot of different great uh, schools and organizations. So it's been yeah. wonderful. Well, your experiences are so varied. There's a couple of them that I want to call out, and then we will talk a lot about what you're currently doing. But I don't know if you know this, but I saw that you were a DJ in Chattanooga. Yeah. You know, I was a DJ too. Oh, I didn't know. In Indiana. So how did you, how did, how did you get that job? Uh, so uh, I, I will, it's completely in the genes. Uh, when uh, I was a child, uh, my that's what my dad always wanted to be was a DJ. And so as a kid, 
uh, they would uh, he would work at different radio stations around Chattanooga. And so uh, they would plop me down with my Kermit the Frog stuffed animal uh, in the production room so I could watch him uh, do his thing. And uh, I absolutely loved it. I thought it was great. I didn't want to do it for a living because it, it doesn't pay a ton. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, so when I was uh, when I was about three or four, my dad let me do a station identification uh, and on air. And it was fantastic because I completely forgot what radio station he worked for and said the radio station we actually listened to his uh, oh, name. No. Uh, so the end of my the end of my station identification was my dad going, no, and then, Just kidding. <laughs> and then putting into a into a record. So but uh, the opportunity when I uh, started going to college, my community college had a, a radio station. And so anytime I wasn't in class, I was uh, in the studio and I ended up uh, because of that. Uh, I was the only paid member of the staff because I started doing the morning show. Yeah. And uh, and then a local station said, "Hey, we, you know, we'd like to hire you to do overnights on the weekend." So uh, I started doing that, and uh, it was great, and I loved it. And then when I was an exchange student uh, in Alaska, we did I did national student exchange. Uh, they also had a radio station, and no one wanted to be up at six o'clock, but. I'm from the Eastern time zone. So that was, that felt pretty late <laughs> to me. So I was like, sure, I'll do six o'clock in the morning. Uh, so it just, that's awesome. Yeah. What, one, one of myself and Alaska broadcaster associations award, uh, award for, uh, I for, uh, produced some uh, commercials for, uh, yeah, an event they had on campus. So it was very exciting. Oh, awesome. See, Matthew, this is the thing about talking to you. I'm like, you have all these experiences and then you just drop an extra seven that I've never heard of before. <laughs> like I was in Alaska and won an award for broadcasting. <laughs> That's pretty remarkable. Well, I was a, um, I worked also at my college uh, NPR station. Mm -hmm. When I graduated from my undergraduate with a psychology degree, you can't get a lot of jobs with an undergraduate degree in psychology. So my mom also worked at a radio station and she got me a job as a, a daytime DJ at a country and Western station, which I do not listen to country music. Yeah. So it was really depressing all day long. <laughs> So like all the sad country songs and somewhere in the middle of that, I was like, I need to go back and get my master's degree and stop doing this job at this little, little tiny station in Indiana. So it's a pretty fun job. If you can talk to yourself, it's a pretty fun job. Oh yeah. It's awesome. I mean, yeah. I basically just had to entertain yourself and no one knows what, no one knows what you're doing in the booth. You're just, right, you're just right. time, so. I used to actually be really surprised because I would just be talking to myself and then I would come out and like the office people would be like, Oh, so that was a strange dream that you had last night. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, people are listening. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was just talking to myself, but nope, there were some people around. Um, so you also worked both for the national park service and for AmeriCorps. And that was, we're going to talk a little bit about your college journey, but were you doing those two things while you were in college or intermittently with your college career? In, intermittently with my college. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things that had, so I was actually in the first class of AmeriCorps in 1994. Wow. Uh, and what it, I didn't even know I was joining AmeriCorps actually when, when I joined. Um, so I, I had gone to see my aunt in Boston and, I said, I really want to go to college, but I, I have no idea how I'm going to pay for that. And she said, well, there's an organization here in town that will pay you money for college if if you join them. And she, and she, she turned and said, oh, well, there's one of them right now. And we were in a, like a, uh, in a pharmacy store. And so I turned and talked to that person and they said, hey, yeah, go by our offices and, and we'll and they'll tell you all about it. So I went down and they said, well, we're going to be in AmeriCorps next year. And I said, I don't know what that is, but okay, sounds interesting. And they said, well, you get to work in schools. And I knew I wanted to be an education major. And I said, and at the end of your time, you'll get $4,725 for college. And for me, that was, I was like, that is incredible. Where do I sign up? Yeah. That's amazing. And so um, about, oof, I guess, three weeks after my 18th birthday, uh, they hired me. Or actually, no, they hired me right before my 18th birthday. And then three weeks later, uh, I moved to Boston from Chattanooga and wow. uh, started working in AmeriCorps uh, with an organization called City Year. And I mean, really that, I'd say that one step is probably the thing that made everything that happened after it possible because I don't know how I would have gone to school if if not for that. Um, and it was an incredible experience and it gave me a lot of confidence 
that I could do these things that yeah. I want to do. I got to work in, in classrooms and uh, they let me lead camps for uh, vacation camps in the spring and the, in the for spring break and winter break. And it, it made, I was a very shy 18 year old that it told me, it was like, Oh, I can, I'm, I'm capable of doing certain things. Uh, and it made, it made it possible for me to go to college. Cause otherwise that, I don't know how that was going to happen. And then, yeah, so that, that was wonderful. And I, I had the, the good fortune of working for AmeriCorps a couple of different times as a staff member or going back in as a, a, a participant. And the National Park Service came kind of from that uh, too. I worked through another organization at two different national parks, which was uh, an incredible experience. That was, I mean, just every one of them was was great. I, re I highly recommend all of those. I worked for an organization called the Student Conservation Association and I worked in Fort Scott, Kansas, uh, beautiful Fort Scott, um, working for the fort there. And uh, I got to develop a children's program, a middle school program, actually, which I recently discovered. Uh, they just said, hey, why don't you come up with something? So I did. And it seemed like it went all right. Uh, I did not realize uh, they just celebrated their 23rd anniversary or 22nd of the, anniversary of the same thing they're still doing. It's called the Trailblazers program. It still exists. Uh, it's actually fun. not that different from what I developed uh, back in 2000. So I like to think there's that little part of me still in uh, Fort Scott, Kansas. Listen, that's so remarkable because you know, as a program builder, so often if it is your program that you built and you leave, it can kind of just like disappear into the ether. And so it for sure speaks to the testament of how good it must be that they're like, oh no, we got to keep keep this up. We got to keep going. That's amazing. Yeah, well, a lot of colleges are the home of the first annuals, but some a lot of them are not home of the second annuals. And so it, it's nice to see that uh, it's sustained at least. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I do want to put all of that early experience in the context of what you have done since um, and thinking about just the breadth of experience. In fact, when I was going to post our session on LinkedIn, I was going to say something about come join me um, and my guest who's worn pretty much every hat there is to wear at a, at a college or a university. So you have experience and you, you were the director of high school programs at an institution. You worked in admissions recruitment, eventually VP for enrollment management, um, student services technology, research analyst around retention. You did first year experience. You were a uh, success center director and then also now the, the student success coordinator. It is just incredible the breadth of experience you have. I, I would assume that helps you quite a bit in your current position because you just understand so many things about how the, the institution works. Uh, I, I'd like to I'd like to think so. I hope so. I don't know if, I don't know if my <laughs> colleagues would agree, but I would I would hope so. Um, yeah. yeah, one of the I, I will say probably one of the biggest eye openers for me early in my career is when I went from admissions whether it was, you know, well, with dual enrollment, which was high school programs, we had a high school on campus. Plus I did the advising for the students. I hired the faculty. Um, I did the, you know, the advising and the registration. So it was a really great first step in higher ed in the fact that I had to touch a whole bunch of different things. It's like a um, mini, it's like a mini institution, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and so it was great. And, and so I had to connect with all these other parts of the institution, things that I may not have understood, but for my job, I was like, oh, I need to partner with these people and, and get to know them better. And and that was a great experience. And then I went to admission, just regular admissions at that point and the technology and the, the data, because we were, everything was getting so, you know, CRMs were becoming, were a hot ticket at that point. Yeah. Um, but uh, after the birth of my first child, I kind of wanted to stop being on the road. And, and that's how I ended up in, in institutional research. And to be honest, that probably was the biggest eye opener for me because I had often thought of IR of, you know, just kind of almost not the, not necessarily the dark side of, of the campus, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's like, I'm asking for this data and they're just not giving it to me. Like, why won't they give me the things I need? And, right. you know, why are they, just, they're, they're not answering my question. They're just asking me more questions. And then when I got to go in there, um, it really helped me understand why those questions were being asked and kind of, you know, I think a very key thing that I've tried to remember throughout my career was, uh, people ask for data, but what they're looking for is information. Right. And that is very, and so it's important that you ask that second question of, are you asking for this, but why are you asking? What for do this? you need to know? Yeah. No, and, and if, 
you know, because actually what you're asking was not what you need. That's not what you're looking for. You're actually looking for this over here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, really opened my eyes in terms of how I deal with, you know, my colleagues and, and speak to them of, okay, they're looking for information and that's why they're asking for this data or I'm looking for information. And it, it really, and I'm much nicer to IR than I ever was uh, before. I'd say, I would never say a bad thing about IR Yeah. Uh, since that time. I really think it's interesting. IR is... Um is so fascinating because, you know, when we work with our schools and getting data into our system, so often the lack of literacy around data, where it comes from, who collects it, if it's real, if it, you know, like, d it does that exist somewhere? So not just where it comes from and is it accurate, but also a real lack of understanding that you can't just ask for something that doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Like you can't just go to IR and be like, and can you also tell me blah, blah, blah? Well, where does that live? Well, we don't collect it. Okay. Well then the answer is no, I can't get that for you. Right. But um, I think it's such a good point that people are asking for information and they're trying to figure out how to get that information. But I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a room with an IR person who's really good and is like, exactly what you said. That's not what you want. I can get you what you need, but this is the way we're going to go about it. And you're going to be much happier with the results. So yeah, it's such a powerful, that understanding of data, I think is going to just get more and more and more and more important. Um, as in all of our jobs, we're trying to make really transparent the work that we're doing and the impact that it has and, and understand our students better and all of that. So I love that. I think it's such an important, um, important, perspective on IR. Um, okay. Sorry. I have two more questions. Well, I have one more question about your background. So you also have been the reviewer of the Journal of College Student Retention, which that's amazing. We could talk about that for a long time, but I would like to get to the most important question I'm going to ask you about your background, which is when you lived in Japan, which we'll talk about in a minute, you were a guest lecturer and you delivered a lecture called the American Southern Culture for Japanese um, high school students. <laughs> yes. What did you, first of all, did you talk about pimento cheese in your Southern culture <laughs> lecture? Do you so, have a strong opinion about pimento cheese? <laughs> so uh, I avoid, because I, I, you know, I didn't want to court controversy. Um, and so I was, yeah. I wanted to be careful. I didn't want there to be. No, you don't uh, want to cause a ruckus. Around. Exactly, yeah, and you know, an, an international incident. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so no, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so it was a high uh, a high school there in Japan in uh, the prefecture I was living in, and um, I I tried to connect everything to something that they were familiar with, um, and so the uh, sweet tea, you know, obviously was included within there. Yeah. And they they're like, okay, we know tea, and they're like, but we put a ton of sugar in it. <laughs> Uh, and we do it while it's hot, and then we put ice in it afterwards. Um, and I, because I knew this would freak them out, uh, I made sure I put pictures of uh, fried catfish um, oh. because uh, catfish is not a fish you eat in Japan. It is a bottom feeder that they would not even. And so it it was it so was designed to gross them out a little bit. They were they're like because I, I found out I figured out what the name what catfish was in Japanese to tell them, and they were like. Eh? And they're, like, oh. they're like, you know, shaking their heads in, in horror. I was like, no, really. Who, we... who in their right mind would eat fried <laughs> catfish? <laughs> exactly. Like, I'm like, but there you go. That's this is something that you know we How eat. Interesting. And, uh, and showing them pictures of stadiums of like college football stadiums and um, you know NFL stadiums in the South. How it was fun. such an eye opener for them. They were all uh, just stunned because you know their notion of what the U.S. is, is completely based upon, you know, media. Right. And so, like, letting them know, like, this is where we're talking about, and this is this is food that is specific to a particular region, and not every American eats it. And, yeah. You know, I love that. Thing. I think it's just so fun. I did, I don't know if you know, but I did a PowerPoint on Frito Pie last year. Oh. Is it, this is the thing that I take very seriously. And so, well, I, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So I always think it's really fun when you're like, here's a thing that, I mean, I have opinions about it and I can tell you about it. And it's even more fun when someone is like, I've never even heard of this thing you're talking about. <laughs> like, Why? Why are you doing that thing? So I love that. It's great. Okay. So let's move on. Now that I have established your many varied experiences that you've had uh, over the course of your life so far, 
I would like for us to go back. You alluded a little bit th- uh, to this about your college journey. So thinking about your experience starting college and then moving through and completing that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so um, my, my parents were wildly supportive of me and my of, of me going to college, um, which was great. Uh, neither one of them have a four-year degree. Um, um, they were 18 when I was born. Um, I grew up in a trailer park uh, on the side of Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga. Uh, our first house was a house that had been a rental property that basically they just kind of abandoned. Uh, and so, but it was huge. Like we were, th- I was thrilled. We we're living in the house, not, not a trailer. Uh, it was really big, but as time, you know, time went on, of course, you know, they're like, it was never a question of if I was going to college, it was like, you're going to go to college when you go to college. Unfortunately, no one knew exactly how that particularly worked. Can I ask you a question about that? Why do you, why, where did they get that perspective that that is a thing that you should do? Do you know? I don't know. I, my, so my grandparents on my dad's side had sixth grade educations. Um, but my grandmother's mother loved teachers. Like they, they thought she thought teachers were great. And so all of her kids thought teachers were great, but, and they knew that to, to be a teacher, you had to have a degree. Okay. Um, my other, my other grandparents had high school diplomas and they were fairly accomplished. My, my grandmother's one of the first uh, women uh, to serve on the insurance adjusters board in the state of Tennessee. And, and my grandfather worked uh, at IBM during World War II. And he was wow. what you would call a computer programmer now, probably, <laughs> but that's, that was kind of not a thing. Um, so they had a notion of like, oh, there's education. It's, it's, a, it's important. And there's these options. And I always wanted to be a teacher, which most kids do at some point because that's the that's a job they know. Mm-hmm. Um, but even as I got older, I would do volunteer work in schools, and I was like, I want to be a teacher. And they're like, Well, I know you, you have to go to college for that for yeah. sure. But I think also for them, the notion of their options were limited, and they knew that by their their lack of formal education for my parents, and so this was something that would allow them. My my mom really wanted to go to the University of Georgia was accepted. She was a national merit semifinalist. Um, however, um, when I came along, that kind of changed a lot of plans. Mm-hmm. So yeah. there's, I think that was part of it too, of like a, a dream deferred kind of thing of maybe I didn't get to do it. Maybe you can, you can do it. But um, they didn't have any idea how to make that a reality. Okay. No, they had no idea. And, and, you know, they tried their best. Um, I, I had no idea. I, I thought scholarships, I thought they, someone was going to show up at my high school with a bag of money and be like, here you go. Here's your, you're so smart. Here's a scholarship right. for you. Um, I thought the FAFSA was just loans. And so I never filled out a FAFSA and it was really complicated. It was this multi-page thing yeah. and tax forms. And I didn't know what that. So I was like, well, I don't want that. That's, that's all loans. And I don't want to get a loan. Um, I didn't really know what they were looking for. And uh, I was a fairly good student, just extremely lazy and unmotivated. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, like I, did, I didn't study, didn't take notes, didn't do those type of things. And so uh, I remember I had a class that was like preparing for college and they said, you have to apply to a school. And so I picked a school that had uh, no application fee because I was like, I, I can afford that one. And it turns out it was a culinary school, which I had no interest in going to, but I was just like, it was free. And so that's why I picked it. Um, Oh my God. Like, you want to be a chef? I was like, no, I don't want to be a chef. I don't know. What why I, no, I, get me out of this. Why are you asking me about being a chef? So I want to camp out there for just a minute because I always say that when, when you belong in a place, when, when you feel like it's legitimate for me to be here, you can't imagine all of the ways that those of us who are not sure we belong there are getting the message that you 100% don't belong here. You don't know what you're doing. You don't, you, you cannot be successful here. And I think things like not filling out the FAFSA because you're afraid it's alone, which holy cow, that would have made your life so much easier <laughs> if you had been able to, if somebody had said, no, 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 no. This is a thing you have to do. No. Application fees. I mean, this is a thing that a certain population of the United States would never think as a barrier to applying to college, much less the fact that somebody had to say, hey, you have to apply to a college. They're not going to show up in your high school and be like, okay, we're taking you. You're going to, we're going to go to this school. So 
I just think that at the very least, thinking about how we are so fluent now in this language of higher education, and yet you can't imagine all of the little things that a 17 or 18 year old that you say to them that they're like, what does that even mean? I have no idea. Yep. I know what you're saying. I have no idea what you're saying. Right. So right. like, I know all these words. I just don't know them in that order. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I can define them all. I just don't know what you're telling me to do. Okay. So you didn't go to culinary school. No, no. So uh, <laughs> luckily city year came along. So I went, uh, moved to Boston, did that for your work in schools. I uh, was terribly homesick by the time at the end, because I was young and I was thrilled. So I was like, I'm going, I'm going to go back to my home, uh, my home university uh, in my hometown. And so I got there and during orientation, and I remember this so clearly, I still tell the story to my students to this day. They said, if you're going to have a good time here, then you need to join a fraternity or sorority. And, uh, and I thought, okay, well, um, I'm not ever going to do that. Like I know that costs money and I have no interest in that. And so, as so literally at orientation, I thought I heard, this isn't for you. Like we're not for you. Like this is, you're not going to have fun here uh, apparently. And so during that first year, basically any sort of roadblock that came up was just another, you know, kind of tick mark on that. See, see what, we're, that's exactly what you said. And by my sophomore year, so I came in my second year, and in October, I don't even remember what it was that time. It was just the last straw. I was like, oh, you know what? They told me from day one I didn't belong here. So I oh, don't. Oh, gosh. So I, I, I dropped out in, in that October, my, my second fall, and was like, well, that's, Again, that's it. Again, it is such a good reminder to those of us who work with students that your intention is to say, this is how you can be successful here. <laughs> And what students can hear is, if you are not going to do this, you don't belong here. And I'm not going to do that, right? Yeah. I, I would have been the same way. If somebody had said to me, the only reason, the only way you can be successful in college is to join a sorority, I would have been like, well, then I'm going to go home because I will never do that. I'm never going to do that. It's just so sad because you know the intention of that person was really good trying to create a pathway for you to be <laughs> successful. And you're like, no, I can definitely like, no, never like, do that. Like, here's a place to belong is what she was trying to say. Right. And, and what she was saying to me was, you don't belong. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm... Oh, and gosh. Now, luckily, my parents did not... I mean, they they were kind of of an opinion of like... So, like, I, I didn't... They didn't go to orientation. I went to orientation because they had to work. So, yeah, and they were like, how did it go? Um, and so when I dropped out, they... Yeah, their first thing was, well, when are you going back? Like, you have to go back. They have to go somewhere. And so I went to the community college in my hometown and... I started in the summer, the next summer after, because I've been working all this time. And uh, I, when I got there, and I'll, I will, full disclosure, I could have started there, but in my head, I was like, well, I don't want to go to a community college. Like, I, I need to go to a university. That's mm -hmm. what I, you know, all these people I met in AmeriCorps, and this is what I've heard, like, you have to go to a university. Yeah. And, and so when I went, to, I almost felt like I'd failed into having to go to a community college. But when I got there, they were so welcoming and basically said, the world's your oyster. What do you want to do? If you want to, if you want to put the effort in, we'll, we'll accept you full, full, full force. And it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. Like it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, everything, uh, the faculty were great. I learned so much in that setting and it was really and that's the thing i tell students now you know it, 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 we all tell them it's about fit and and for me at that time that was my perfect fit was was being at that community at Genesee state community college fantastic still love it uh my brother's there now um so we're we're trying to keep the trend going yeah <laughs> um but, but it was incredible and um uh, i but unfortunately i still didn't know how the fafsa worked <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I would, uh, I would go to school for a year, work for a year, go to school for a year, work for a year. And so I graduated from Chattanooga State, went back to UTC for a little bit. Um, still wasn't, I wasn't feeling it completely. Would go work and then go back to Chattanooga State, even though I already had my associate's degree. I, there was real, I just, but I was like, oh, I feel at home there. That That's, I need to regroup and see my next step. And finally, uh, they made a change into licensure in the state of Tennessee. And there's only one university left in the state that was that was uh, doing licensure the old way, where I could do K-8 licensure, which is what I wanted. 
And so I ended up transferring to the University of Memphis and went there. And when I went there, I had to live in a dorm. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I have to get a loan now because I don't know how I'm going to afford this. And so I filled out the FAFSA for the first time as a 24-year-old non-traditional oh transfer student. And it turns out I was a full Pell the entire time and had no idea. Uh, and so I got, so they, they said, oh, well, yeah, college is free <laughs> for you. Oh, my uh, goodness. Here, here you go. Um, plus, your housing is basically paid for. You have to pay for board, but that's about it. Um, wow. And what a I was, relief. Yeah, I was so relieved. And and it was so great to do that. Um, however, I will say, so my, my orientation experience, that they made me go to orientation as a non-traditional transfer student. On my birthday, I had to drive uh there and it was very much a freshman orientation that i was just in there for it yeah and as they're doing like the raw raw you know kind of my name is matthew <laughs> i was like let's let's get oh I, I want to register let me register for <laughs> um and so there's one of those things where and that i will be honest all of these experiences inform what i do as a professional now yeah um but yeah when i got in there i was able to be an exchange i did national student exchange to the university of alaska fairbanks which was great i did my student teaching and i loved it um so i and and i'll be honest you know while there was a lot of struggle in that period um i am forever grateful that i graduated from, and, and it was, I mean, it, when I graduated, it was an event, like oh my, my aunts and uncles and my cousins and, you know, my grandparents and my parents, my brother, like everyone converged in Memphis uh, to see me graduate, which was uh, incredible. And it, it, you know, and it realized kind of the weight I was carrying for my family in, in, in doing that. And, and since then, I'm not the last one to graduate from a university, which is great. I'm, I'm not the last one with a bachelor's degree, um, which I take a lot of pride in the fact that my cousins have pursued education and, and you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes the same kind of winding path that I've, that I have. But I mean, you earned that degree, Matthew, you earned it. <laughs> right? <laughs> there was no like, and then I went to college. There was like, <laughs> I earned a degree. And I get a little bit moved about that because I was just teaching a class yesterday um, college students. And I was talking about how the work that we do at Ferris, yes, we're a technology company, but we really believe in the way that we change family trees when a student earns their degree and how for all of the people around them, their cousins, their siblings, whoever it is, it changes what they think is possible. It changes the trajectory of their path. And also, I was thinking for so many of us, we know the person two generations ago, my grandmother, Allie Mae Jones from Alabama, is the first person in my family who went to college. And I know she's the one who did that for my family, mm -hmm. right? And for so many of us, we have the name of the person last generation, three generations ago, it doesn't matter, who earned their degree and sort of negotiated all through all of that stuff and made sense of it. And then set the rest of the generations up to be like, oh, yeah, we have somebody who has expertise in that. So it's really beautiful, I think. Yeah, For generations, they're going to be like, you know, my great, great grandpa, Matthew Little. Is <laughs> great grandpappy Matthew. He, uh... Yeah, it's super. It's just amazing. Um, all right. So I think you've said a little bit about this, um, but. I, I imagine you are like I am in that those early experiences just shape everything about the way you talk to your students and the way that you engage with them. Is that true for you? Definitely. I, what I've always kind of thought is I, I try to be the person I wish I had had yep. uh, when I was going through this. It's someone that you know I could have asked the questions of. Someone who, even though I didn't want to raise my hand and ask the question, so the person would have been like, I'm going to ask you the question so yeah. that you get the answer and, and draw you out to let you know you do belong and hear those questions, hear those answers that you need, whether or not you you ever want to vocalize it. I know you need them. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so that's I, what I try to do now. I have a very strong feeling of like, I just needed somebody to be on my team. Yeah. Like, I just needed somebody to be like, hey, I'm on your team. What's the thing we're trying to solve today? You know, yeah. <laughs> the thing I'm trying to solve today is whatever. 
okay, I have some expertise in that. I'm going to help you do that, which I think is just really great language for our students to understand that um, we can apply our hard earned learning to their experiences now and say, I have some expertise that I have to offer you and I'm on your team and I'm like all in. I don't know if I'm sure that you do. I always find that there's the name of one or two people who decided you are going to graduate from this institution, right? And yep. this is the person who was like, just w whatever it takes, whatever we need to do in order to get you through. Do you have, do you have a person like that? So there's a, and oddly she's, she's not even at the institution I graduated from, but she was the person and she's now the Dean of the college of education at UTC. Uh, her name was Valerie Rutledge. And when I was in my first PDS for professional development school for, so basically it was a, you know, student teaching light. She talked to me the entire time as though I was definitely going to graduate yeah. and that I belonged and that I was capable and, and that if I had a question, it wasn't a dumb one or it wasn't, it wasn't a gotcha to get you to, because as an imposter, with the imposter syndrome, you're like, oh, they're just waiting to catch me and they're going to kick me out at that point because I don't belong. Yeah. Um, but she didn't do that. And every interaction with her was, was so affirming that I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I can, I can do this. Like this is, and I did my student teaching back home because I know I could, that was the way I could afford it to make sure was, you know, to do it at home and live with my parents. And she was still, and I, so I partnered with UTC as a Memphis student and she was there as the dean and she remembered and you know me and i thought i can't believe she remembered me as this just one person this one time in the semester um but she still talked to me that way so it, it it was so genuine and the look on her face when she would say things and we're like oh she means this this isn't yeah. this isn't her job this is she really believes in me and which so is funny there. now as a student success professional it is always funny when students are like, "You do you remember me? And you're like, of course I remember you. Like, of course. We walked through some in really important things together. Of course I do. You know, I love that so much. Um, okay. So I'm trying to figure out, I do want to talk about your experience in Japan, but I also want to talk about the work that you're doing now. So I think what we're going to do is let's talk about what you're doing now and how you've kind of brought your perspective to your institution. And then we're going to end on your time in Japan. <laughs> okay. All right. So you are now at the University of Tennessee Southern. Can you help our um, listeners just give us some context about the change of that school um, where it's located, what kind of students you serve and that sort of thing. Then we'll talk a little bit about how you are currently working with students. Sure. Uh, so the University of Tennessee Southern has only existed since uh, July 1 of 2021. However, in the 150 years before that, it was a Martin Methodist College. So it was a, a very small uh, private uh, institution for all those 150 years. Um, in the summer of 21, uh, the University of Tennessee system acquired uh, the institution. Um, we're located in Pulaski, Tennessee. Uh, it's a, a small rural community. Uh, and we are still a small rural serving institution, even with the University of Tennessee name. So we have less than 1,000 students. It's almost 1,000 at this point, but that's kind of been uh, our size. We serve primarily uh, Southern Middle Tennessee um, which uh, does not have a high post-secondary uh, education attainment rate. Um, there's a lot of places uh, with uh, that are under-resourced, under-resourced schools, under-resourced communities. Uh, we also serve some of the North Alabama counties right below us uh, on the other side of the border. Um, but we, we are a, a small institution in, in a small town. Uh, now we are about an hour south of Nashville and about 45 minutes north of Huntsville. So we're not completely isolated from yeah. the region, but the, the area around us is very much uh, what you would imagine as, a, as a, a, a rural institution. A lot of our students, you know, their, their classes and what they can do are, are based upon agricultural schedules. A lot of them, you know, still work, you know, in farms. Um, and, and or they'll ask questions like, I need to go bush hogging. How long is this test going to take? Because I need to, you know, mom and dad need me back on the farm yeah. Yeah. or that sort of thing. So, 
So when you guys made the change to the University of Tennessee system, that's when that your your school really was like, hey, we have to have a position that's going to focus on student success and retention, right? Yes. Um, they they knew they were in they were struggling. Um, you know, enrollment is so key for especially for a small faith based institution. Those those are struggling across. Them. Yeah. Um, but also to do that, you know, your enrollment plans a lot of times are going to be based upon like just we got to get people. We we have to have people. We can't be overly choosy. We need to do what we can do. And part of this, I mean, the retention rate was you know around fifty percent. It was hovering in the fifties. Um, the graduation rates were uh, really low, and so uh, there was an app. They applied for a Title III grant for strengthening institutions, and uh, they finally received it uh, the year before. So the year of the merger. So they were in the merger. Kind of started talking about it in the fall of twenty, and then it was completed in twenty one. And that's actually how I, I came to be. So I'm I am actually from. Uh, they the position was created for the first time ever of person over student success uh, through the Title III grant. And, and so I actually arrived on campus after the switch over uh, to UT Southern. Um, and so the, the, I, I was I was told, all right, let's let's get some let's get some attention, <laughs> let's get some graduation, let's get some uh, persistence. Uh, what, what do we need to do? And so, you know, they had done a lot of work on the front end of like, well, here's things that we know we're struggling in. Um, what do we do with it now? And I, I will say, uh, one of the the best things they did in that first year, as they were kind of here, was uh, contacting Pharos actually, and and partnering with them to to be able to get uh, Pharos 360 as as their case management system. It was uh, that was probably the smartest move they made in that that first year. I mean, before I got there, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was because uh, it, it immediately took some steps. It started getting them some steps in the right direction. Well, you have done remarkable work there. I was just looking at your Spark report. I mean, I think you guys, so I, I, you had lower retention rates before we started partnering with you before you came. Um, but I think over the last couple of years, you've had the highest retention rates that you've ever had on your, um, oh, like overall, right? Not just your freshmen, but in every one of those classifications. And you also have done such a remarkable job on your transfer retention. I think it's up something like 10% yeah. uh, since you guys started. So besides us, obviously, what, what would you say is the, the approach that you are taking to serve your students in a way that's making such a remarkable impact? Uh, I think the, the first step was identifying where we were, where we were struggling. Um, we, we were clearly, there were pot, pockets of population throughout the campus that we were not serving to the best of our ability. And honestly, figuring out who that, if, if you don't know their problem is you can't fix it. Yeah. And so being able to identify those different groups of students, in in some cases there was some intersectionality between those groups too, kind of looking and seeing where we were struggling. Um, Every school I've ever worked at has said retention's everybody's business, um, but when it's everybody's business, it's nobody's business too. Amen. Um, True. You know, when I got here, um, so while I'm, I'm the point person, the chancellor and the provost both were very clear. Like this is this is literally we're all Matthew will be the conduit, but we're all going to do this, and we're going to engage you, and we're going to have those discussions, and we're going to put our money where our mouth is in terms of. Um, well, not actual money, but we're going to put, put it where <laughs> this is this is important, and we are going to evaluate things based on these actions. We're going to you know encourage. We're going to support you based upon these actions and, and these outcomes that we want to look for. And so, really having that where literally the entire institution's focus turned towards being you know getting student make, helping make students successful. Yeah. You know, from onboarding, you know, recruiting to onboarding to when they're in the classroom. To when they're in the campus, when they're in the dorms, um, that that made a huge impact because at that point, whatever I'm doing is becomes auxiliary to the other things that are happening throughout the students' you know lifetime on campus in the classroom 
and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, it's such an interesting perspective, isn't it? So I think one of the advantages of being a smaller school is that you can turn that vision to we are not just doing what we do in little pockets, but actually we have this broad student life cycle perspective, which is if we admit them, we're saying they can be successful and we've got to figure out how to how to give them a path forward, which I really love. But it is really interesting at so many institutions that that is not their perspective. It's it's actually more common for an institution to lack a retention and student success perspective across the board than it is to have an institution that's like, no, we're all doing this and we're all going to get behind this vision. It's it's just very strange that that has not sort of evolved because our business is helping students to be successful. And yet in some ways, institutions don't articulate that. And I'm wondering for you the difference between a big institution and a small institution, not just in the everybody get behind this vision, but also in the ways that you're able to engage with students in your connections and the kinds of things that you're solving for them. Certainly. And, and that's one thing, because we're smaller and, and even small in, in geographical size, um, you can't hide. I mean, it's impossible to hide. And, and because everyone is on board too, if I if there's a student that I need to contact and I cannot find them, I can talk to their faculty member. They're like, if I see them, I'll grab them. I can talk to their coach, and they will say, I will send them down there right now. Or I can talk to their RA, and you know, no matter where they are, there's a way to find that to find them. Yeah. And and we just and we reach out to them. And and the other thing is when we're reaching out to them, it's not impersonal. It's a I know who you are, and you're not in trouble we're trying to find a way to support you through this. And so being able to reach out to them and find, you know, wherever they are and but be very clear. And also I tell them my story constantly of like, look, I was a giant screw up. And if you make half them, you're not even making half the mistakes I make. Right. <laughs> so, and they don't call me Dr. Little because my first name's doctor, right? They <laughs> uh, like, so there's a way through this. Yeah. And that they know like this is, we're coming from a place of care and support. And, and I think you mentioned it, promise. You know, we told you, we accepted you on the basis that you're going to be able to graduate yep. and we will do everything we can in partnership and in concert with you to help you achieve that, that possibility because it takes both of us, but you know, we're going to do that. Yeah. I love that. It's funny when I was doing academic probation with my students and I, and they would be like, you know, I mean like GPAs of like 0.5, you know, and they'd be like, Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. And I'd be like, do you know what my GPA was when I was in school? And they're like, no. And I'm like, that's right. You don't, you have no idea. I was a terrible student. So you don't have to be, be embarrassed. It's nice to be able to offer that vulnerability and also the expertise that says, if you stick with me, we're going to get you through this. We're going to figure out how to make it better. So I really love that. Um, I was thinking about the things that we have to solve for our students. So thinking about like how you find your students and we talked about this connection. And it's really funny, you and I were talking before we started just about all of the things that you have to help students figure out. And so many of those things have nothing to do with your job. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. Where it's like, how do I get insurance or go to the doctor or those sorts of things. And I would imagine given your population that you're serving and a smaller um, city that you have a lot of those things pop up. Uh, we do. And one of the things that we end up seeing is not only are we supporting the student, we also have to support the family because so many of them are first generation yeah. families. And so we have to help them navigate these things as well and help them understand how it works. Um, but I mean, there's things, and honestly, it's even things like um, breakups and, uh, you know, my dad wants me to go to work right now, or it's also things like, I can't afford gas. I don't know where I'm going to get gas. How do I, I need to work because I can't afford these books. Um, and the, it's amazing how many times you have those conversations. And luckily you, as you have them, you're like, all right, we've got to build resources around yeah. these needs. But also, yeah, I don't want to have those conversations and then be like, good luck. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. I want to have those conversations and be like, and we have a grant that's going to help you with right. that thing that you're asking for. Right. <laughs> don't, and, and don't just do empathy. We need to have some actual action in that. And one of the weird things, and one of the things that I've, has come up a lot, especially in the last couple of years, I've noticed is training students how to advocate and navigate their work experience because some of them, because, you know, some places are really short on work. And so anyone who's working is getting, is working a lot. Yeah. 
uh, helping them to be able to navigate to say, you know, if you told your employer you need to be in class on these days, you, you know, you, and, and they agree to that, you need to talk, you know, let's talk about how do we communicate with your employer to make sure you, you know, aren't having to subjugate your academic that's needs effective. because yeah. of that. And that's something that, you know, I don't think I would have even thought about would be something that a college would do when I was in college. But like for our students, they desperately need it because they're like, look, they're going to tell me, I'm, they told me I'm going to lose my job if I don't do right. this or this. And right. so, you know, trying to figure out like, okay, let's help you find better employment then. Um, let's help you, you know, let's help you figure out how you have these conversations with people. Yeah. It's why I love student development so much because it really is just such a beautiful time in life when you are becoming a fully grown adult, but also have no idea what you're doing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so all of the ways that we can say, no, this is how you show up at work and these are your rights and this is how you get a lease and this is what you should expect and how you have conflict and you know all of those kind of things and i was thinking about just your success in what you're doing on campus thinking about your higher risk population so you know this is the population that we've identified on your campus where it's like these are your most vulnerable students you really want to put a lot of resources and make sure they have those connections that you're solving. And so I don't, I think you guys talked about this in your spark meeting, your high at risk population was a at a retention rate of 30.3%. Mm -hmm. And we were like, here's the population that you need to work. And you worked really hard and you increased their retention to almost 50%. So an increase of almost 20%. That's amazing. And that's just an iterative process. That's just, we're just going to get better and better and better. Um, and I, yes, we think about retention and we want financial health for our institution and all of that. But I just think about the names. Like I just think about the names of those students who, because you were super intentional, about getting good at supporting them, they just are going to have a different story. It's just, it's really amazing. You've done such a, a remarkable job. Like watching them cross the green at graduation and you you sit there and you go, this is their future. Like I'm, I'm. it's almost like at the end of a movie when they're like, well, here's what happened to all these characters. Yeah. When you see them like, oh, I can almost in my head see like this, there's a better life ahead for this for student. Sure. Who I may have met on probation there for my first semester, and now here they are walking across uh, the green. Yeah, and I would say I think one of the biggest blessings of the work that we get to do is that you get to be part of someone's story that they then say 20 years later, oh, yep, yeah, I remember, you know, Dr. Little, he's the one who decided I was going to graduate and walked with me. And that is so, that is priceless that, that their kids hear your name in conjunction with, this is the reason why I was successful. I think it's really amazing. Um, okay, so I would just like to say we're at time. So I'm going to thank everybody for listening. If you want to hear about how Dr. Little became a star of a reality show, you can stick around with us because I'm going to get him to tell us that story. Um, but I think you can hear just from this uh, conversation that we've had how much those formative experiences of, of challenge and struggle help you be a better student success professional. Um, and just the, I, it's just so good to be reminded of the power of the jobs that we get to do um, and the, the privilege it is to be able to make an impact on people's lives for generations to come. So I think it's really awesome. All right, so you are in Japan you were a stay-at-home dad, right? Yep. Okay. First of all, how did you get to Japan? Uh, so uh, <laughs> we, I had been going through my career and you know working my way through, and and you know I had a, a vision in mind of what I wanted to do by the time I hit forty, and I got to it, and like a lot of things uh, that can happen, and uh, when you when you get the thing you're you want, you're like, oh, this turns out this is not actually I did not what want I this. wanted. I didn't want that. I think it back. That was. <laughs> Um, you know, because, and that's, one, <laughs> and that's one of the sad things about, uh, sometimes about higher ed too, is that, uh, the higher up you go, the further away you get from the thing that you love the most. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of what was happening. And so I, I, I told my wife, I said, look, you, you, I've been dragging you around to all these different places. You find something and I will, I will go and we will go and we'll do it. And, uh, she's like, well, there's a job uh, uh, opening in Tokyo. <laughs> 
to be a faculty member at the university there. Wow. And that's actually, uh, she had taught there before we got married. I was like, okay, sounds good. Let's, let's try it. And we got <laughs> it. Uh, and so I was like, okay, well, I guess we're doing this for real now. And so we uh, moved to Japan. She was, she worked at uh, Tokyo International University um, and she had a great time. And so I was like, okay, well, let me finish my dissertation, but I'll take care of everything at home. And so I'll do everything that needs to be done. I'll get the kids ready. I'll get them to school. Uh, we'll take care of all that. I'll do all the things that uh, need to be done so she doesn't have to worry about anything except for you know, going to work and then coming back in. And so didn't think much of it. It was like this, this would have, we would have done this in the States too. Everything was fine. And I went to the airport to pick up my in-laws who were coming to visit us. And these people came up and said, hi, we're with a Japanese TV show. What are you doing in Japan? <laughs> and uh, I said, I said, well, I, I, uh, or why did you come to Japan? I said, oh, I, I live here. Yeah, but my my work work uh, works for a university here. And they go, well, what do you do? Uh, which is a very Japanese question to ask. Like they're they're like knowing what your occupation is is a very very important uh, very important. And I said, oh, I said I'm just, I'm a stay at home dad. You know, I just stay at home. And you know, and they're like, wait, wh what? What do you what do you do? I said, <laughs> well, I'm a stay at home dad. You know, I wash dishes, I wash clothes. You know, I get the kids ready for school. And they're like, oh, we we have that too. Um, we call that a housewife. And I said. Okay, yeah, I mean, <laughs> sure. I said, yeah, and they're like, we have to, we have to see what your day looks like. Okay. And I thought, okay, sure. I was like, this is some random person with a YouTube channel, uh, <laughs> and like, I, I, I'm never gonna hear from this person again. And uh, they call, they emailed me and said, and said, okay, we we'd love to see you come visit. I was like, okay. And they said, well, this is the show we're with. And so they told us the name. Which I think is a U Nani Hashi Nippone. I think is, oh. is that there. Which is okay. what are you doing in Japan? That's that's what it is. Oh, means. okay. And I look it up and it's like a real show. It's like a nationally broadcast show. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I I have definitely been off more than I can chew. Um, I said, sure, yeah, come come watch, I guess. Uh, and so they came to our house uh, for two days, twelve hours each day, and filmed me um, washing dishes, washing clothes, holding, folding clothes, <laughs> hanging them up, vacuuming, um, taking my daughter to her bus stop for her to go to her, her daycare. It was riveting, I'm sure. Exactly. And at one point they said, we thought your schedule might would be more hectic. And I thought, well, that is the most polite way I've ever been told my life is boring. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, but I came for two days and and uh, I took my daughters to a park and I because I wanted to tell them my my oldest daughter really wanted more friends but she wasn't in Japanese school she was still in online American school at that point and I said it's really tough because you know one as a as a male that's very unusual for me to be the one taking the kids out to the park uh, and then you know being very obviously American like we clearly were not Japanese in yeah. any way <laughs> shape or form. Um, and so they wanted to make, they wanted to keep watching us go to parks until I met a, a fellow, uh, a Shifu, um, friend, which is, uh, the housewife basically. So, uh, and so eventually we, I did meet another, another mom at the, uh, at the park. And so, uh, and they, and so I think my episode, something like, um, American, um, uh, man does housework question mark um uh, uh former teachers park debut i think is what it is what it said on the screen How funny. and i was like okay sure and this is never going to air because this is so boring there's no this is never gonna air. <laughs> and then in february they said oh by the way it's gonna it's gonna run and so we got on there and we watched it and it was incredible and it was very cool i was like well that's really neat i don't think anyone watched this um because why would you and then <laughs> we went on twitter and there were like tons and tons of people talking about us on twitter that had watched the show oh my like, gosh how strangers. surreal and we had to translate all of them because they were in japanese and then one of my wife's friends that lived in taiwan said were you just on a tv show in japan <laughs> And apparently it broadcast in Korea and Taiwan and, oh and all over the nation. Gosh. And we're like, how weird. And so uh, one day we were walking to 7-Eleven and there were these kids walking a block away from us. And we didn't think much of it because like, yeah, there's kids everywhere. We get into the 7-Eleven and 
we're getting some stuff and I, I go, Oh, I forgot something in the last aisle. And I cut back quickly. And there those kids are with their phones up. Like they had been filming. Harassing uh, you. Yes. Around, uh, <laughs> you around were famous. Uh, people stopped us in the park, uh, people at the grocery store, they'd be like, they would be sitting there and then they would be like, I saw you on TV and then oh. go back to, to work. Um, how we went, strange is that? Oh, it was so weird. We went to the other side of the country for a vacation and this little girl came running up to my daughter and gave her a big hug and said, Penny Chan, Penny Chan. And I said, sweetie, who, who's that? And she's like, I don't know. I, I guess I go to school with her. I said, no, sweetie, we like took a flight to be here. Right. <laughs> and, and we were like, oh, she saw her on the TV. Wow. And, uh, and then a year later, they wanted to do a Where Are We Now little special on us. So we were on a second time. And it was oh, interesting. Uh, it was just, it was really bizarre. You know, what's so nice about that, though, is that when your children are older, you are going to have this like little time capsule of what it was like when they were younger and what your days look like. And I mean, that's pretty precious to have, you know, <laughs> well, and also the weirdest I, uh after so I, I talked to you know about the um I got an email last week they they wanted to talk to us again like on uh so I, I don't know if our episode did really well or something or yeah. if uh because I, I unfortunately I don't speak Japanese so I don't know you're I don't very know. famous in Japan yeah there, there could be I, I could have some sort of nickname and there's like <laughs> there's an anime based on me or something but um, we're gonna have to do some research on this. We're, research gonna, on we're gonna have to put some punctuation on the story and see, like, yeah, you're just well, super well known in Japan. Is it, I, I go there. There's people with my face on their shirts or something. And... <laughs> That's a little bit unnerving, right? Isn't it kind of scary when someone? I mean, it's kind of like where we started with being a DJ when somebody's like, "I know these things about you," and you're like, "I've never met you before in my life." Right. How do you know I'm this? You feel, yeah, I'm glad you feel close to me, but I, you're a stranger. I don't know who you are. <laughs> I was just a person in a room talking to myself. I didn't. <laughs> right. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining me today. It has been such a delight. And I know we could probably do another three episodes and unpack, <laughs> unpack some more of your experiences. But um, I know that our listeners have so enjoyed it. And I appreciate you sharing just your gift of uh, love for students with us. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I, I loved it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you later. Bye.